right, I'm gonna start our call. <laughs> we'll do fun little intro here. Welcome. You thank are you, thank on you. The podcast. Wait, where did where did this where did this sound effect come from? Did you make this for Trippy? Yeah, this is our this is our theme song. Who did it? Blake Symphony. Oh my gosh, Blake! Thank you Blake. for being a symphony. Blake is amazing. We 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 met him through you you know Grace. And, and oh, I, I do know Grace. They are good friends with Blake, and that was how we met Blake. And uh, he's good people, so he created this awesome theme song for us. Should we start with how we know each other? We absolutely should. So let me do my quick intro. I'm going to do my, this is the trippy podcast. You are here with uh, myself, Adelaide Braddock. I am the CEO of Trippy, co-founder. Um, my co-founder and partner in crime is not going to be able to join us for this, unfortunately. So it's just me and Greg, Esser, Mr. Workforce Planning. What's that mean? Um, I, help, I help kind of mid-cap businesses that grew quickly. Uh establish their practices and methods so that they can grow even bigger. I like it. I mean, that's, that's, that circles back to kind of why we know each other. Yes. Which is, I, I was brought in at Stratus um, after doing a lot of kind of the workforce planning consulting that I've done for 12 odd years in DC, but <laughs> I took a big plunge, joined a little startup in Philadelphia um, where, where you happen to be already be well embedded you taught me all those ropes. And I think for a brief time, we had the same exact title. Yes. Um, and then we had to be like, yo, we should make these titles different because we don't do the same thing. Right. Well, and it's <laughs> funny because it didn't, uh, it, your influence on on me when we were working together was such that like, I thought we had been working together a lot longer than we had when the pandemic hit. We went into lockdown because we were, you had like started in December of 19. I showed up in December. I didn't start getting paid till January of 2020. <laughs> Startup life, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> God. Well, I was doing I was doing this crazy thing uh, yeah. that ties back to some travel-y type stuff too, right. where I had quit my job uh, in DC after 10 years. I had driven a van uh, 10,000 miles across Eurasia. Yes. And then I had come back to the States with no job and told six of my friends that they, that I was going to do a week long internship for them. And one of those friends was none other than Brett Dietrich. Yes. Um, so I showed up to Stratus. Not for, of Dietrich's meets. Not of Dietrich's meets, different yeah. Dietrich family. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the three Dietrich families that, that graced their presence to so the many, Stony, Stony so many Run Dietrich's Valley of Kempton, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's our, that's our running thing is there's, it's, it's all the Dietrichs of Kutz, Kutz town. And there's only like seven Kutzes in the whole area. <laughs> yeah. More Dietrichs than Kutzes, Kutztown, Pennsylvania. I still have friends when they see the Dietrich meets, when they see Brett and the Dietrich, and they think of Dietrich's meets, uh, roadside I-78. Um, they they ask Brett about the quality of I, I did that. Meets. I yeah. did that. That's, I, I, I did not ask Brett about the quality of his meets. Um, I did <laughs> ask if they were related to. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think my friends know the answer, so therefore they still ask about the quality of the music. <laughs> there's some good, there's some good stories that come out of that family. That is a wild, a wild ass family. It's <laughs> true, but yes, yeah, so I showed up on on the Stratus doorstep for for a one week internship uh, at my own behest, without actually being accepted to have an internship, and uh, I got I got hooked. I got hooked quick, like immediately. Like that was like a day of like you're hired, and you were like, I am still interning but sure why not <laughs> yeah i mean one of the one of the reasons i got hired apparently is because uh the, the founders of that company saw my travel videos while i was doing that ten thousand mile road trip from la Havre, france to alain batar mongolia um i put out a video every thursday and uh the, the co-founders of stratus saw those videos so based on very little of my previous work experience but my hilarious, hilarious on-camera presence, uh, jumping into mud pits in Azerbaijan, they were like, "Yeah, we should probably work with this guy." Phenomenal! That is amazing. Well, I want to get into I want to get into all of that because I have been very curious about your travels for a long time, um, and mainly because you've been through Central um, Asia, and I never have, and I've always wanted to. I think the stands are, I mean, you know, with exception. So I, I, I mean, lived in Pakistan when I was a kid, but I don't really consider that for some reason, part of all of that. That's very like Indian subcontinent to me, which is a whole other world in my mind from like Kazakhstan or, or Turkmenistan or any of these other places. Right. So like, I, I'm very curious to know your experiences, but before we get into that, 
But so, wait, there's more oh, wait. tagline. <laughs> Hold on, more. Tune in later. Wait, can you, you can do the sub. The cliffhanger. Oh, the cliffhanger, but the little sub sub chapter headings. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Okay. That's bumper. I'm an experienced podcaster too. I have 50 episodes of an ultimate frisbee podcast. Of your own. Uh, it was affiliated with the prof- semi-professional ultimate frisbee team of Washington D.C. They're called the Breeze, and the podcast is defunct. But uh, for oh, four years, for four years, was called as as you would imagine a Breeze podcast would be Hot Air. That is spectacular. That is a spectacular name. That is so perfect for you. <laughs> and how I knew, like your sense of humor. Yes. Yes. All of the yes. I'm here for it. It played. It played. Phenomenal. Holy crap. Oh my God. Well, okay. So um, when I, yeah. So when I met you, um, you were this, this incredible world traveler who actually put a lot of my travel experiences to shame. I was just like, man, that's like insanely, you know, I, and it, what's even funnier was um, when we went into lockdown after, after uh, COVID and everything. Um, and uh, so, so our, our startup got sold. I left almost immediately because f- corporate life, <laughs> like absolutely like no. Um, and then uh, started you know, doing full time. You left um, not too long thereafter or were asked to leave. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not on, not on my own volition. It was uh-huh. uh, the, the twisted tale of, of equity oh, buyouts goodness. in corporate America. Uh, mm-hmm. They flew the, my new boss who I'd never met or exchanged more than maybe a half dozen emails with flew into Philadelphia. I was excited to work with her. I'm shaking her hand. And while she's shaking my hand, she delivers the news that she is eliminating my position effectively immediately. Wonderful. It was, it was a real uh, master stroke. Oh my, my uh, that is excellent. Yeah. But oh, I mean, I, I, I got laid off on a Tuesday Okay. Um, that Friday, I was actually on a plane to Turkey. Yep. Uh, I worked with Syrian refugees on the border for a month. Um, so I, I found did, my I found my rewards. You, I found my rewards one way or another out of how did that turn bad happen? So yeah, like like sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm just I'm like that that blows my mind. Like how did that turnaround happen so quickly? Uh, well, so I so my uh, life story, which I suppose you're going to get bits and pieces <laughs> of throughout this, is. At the the ripe age of 23, looking for that first job, that first break, um, I signed on with a USAID international development contractor mm-hmm. and worked in Baghdad um, in 2008 and nine. Okay, and that group of people was super talented and super world travelers and multinationality folks. That now you could throw a dart at a map and I would hit somebody. Wow. Um, and so one of those friends now works uh, in Sean Lorfa, right on the Syrian border, public high school. Um, and I've talked to her for two years, like one of my half-baked ideas that I wanted to make it over somehow. And uh, on a Tuesday afternoon, head still spinning, I shot mm-hmm. her a Facebook message and I said, there's cheap flights this weekend. What do you think if I came over for four weeks and just you know, volunteered in your classroom and mm-hmm. practice some English with the kids? And she was like, yeah, let's do it. Mm. Wait, so did you need a visa? Uh, in Turkey, you can buy a visa at the airport for $50. No kidding. As yeah. as an American or as, as like, an American? Okay. As an American. Okay. okay. So with an American passport, you can buy a visa at the airport. So upon arrival, you pay 50 US dollars. Yeah, I think it might, it might depend on airport. The, the letter of the law, I believe, this is a fun thing about traveling. Letter <laughs> of the law, I think, is 50 bucks. Yeah. And Ankara, uh, it'll cost you 50 bucks because that's the administrative capital of everything. Sure. I think in Istanbul and Izmir, they might charge you a little extra, mm. uh, pad, pad the pockets, but it uh, mm-hmm. should, be, should, be, should be 50 bucks, I believe. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. It, you know, and this has been my experience when I travel abroad and someone says it's supposed to be this cost because this happened to us in Rome. We took a taxi and they said, okay, from the airport to anywhere in Rome, it's 30 euro from the from the airport and so we got into our hostel and i went to pay the driver and i only had a 50 note on me um and i you know and he said he said oh it's you know 45 euro and i said i'm and i but i kind of like had this moment of looking at him i was like a i'm really tired i've had a very long day um we had a really weird flight coming in and i'm just not in a place to feel like i need to argue with this guy because i like you also don't know like can i argue is this going to cause problems for me (laughs) i'm in a foreign place right so you just kind of like go with it and later on i was like i <laughs> yeah, yeah, and in, in Italy, it's it's rough because you're talking about in euros. What I catch myself doing sometimes 
is I'm in like a more a developing country where clearly the currency is in my advantage and I feel right. uh, bent out of shape all day because I dropped an extra three local something and I'm like, don't let that ruin a travel experience. Yeah, you got ripped oh, off. Yeah. But you, got rip, you got ripped off for 50 cents. I mean, exactly. Well, that, <laughs> that's that I had my wallet stolen in China when I, uh, not too long after I'd moved there. And I was very freaked out. I was, I was ranting. I was running. I was like, why, you know, in Chinese, I'm like, why, why I'm just a teacher. Like what the hell? You know, I was just very like, you know, upset and everything. And these two women who spoke really wonderful English came up and they were like, can we help help? You know, what can we do? What happened? I said, oh, my wallet got stolen. They said, well, what was in it? And I said, um, my bank card. And they're like, oh, okay. And he can't use the bank card because you have to have the pin. And they said, well, what else? And I said, some receipts. And they said, okay, any money? And I said, yeah. And they're like, how much? I said, 70 UN. <laughs> it's like $10 <laughs> less. I was like, and they're looking, they literally stopped and looked at me and said, why are you freaking out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In English, they said, why are you, why are you freaking out? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's well said. I mean, I, I get wrapped around money very frequently it's easy and, to do. and, uh, in, because we are lucky to be operating on American currency and yeah. carrying American passports in, uh, yeah. it feels like 60% of the world, maybe 70% of the world. It's uh, getting ripped off for 10, 20 bucks or less. Is, right. Uh, should, should usually not make you fret. It's not, $20, $10 American isn't going to hit us as hard necessarily as, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, I feel you. Well, yeah, it's a good, it's a good takeaway. I like that. I like that mentality of like, yeah, just let it go. And it's, it, it, and, and, and to be fair, I don't always have it, but I mean, I think it's worth, it's worth, <laughs> it's worth saying here that, yeah, take the step back, be the, be I'm the, such a, yeah. I'm such a, I don't know, person, I, the words just told you know, when that happens, when you're like, I'm going to say this really awesome thing and it's going to be really gripping and powerful. And then yeah. the moment comes and the words just <laughs> stop and you're like, well, that, I blew that. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah. anyway, okay. But more about yeah. You. So so yeah. So that Friday, uh, I was on on that plane and lucky to have the the network I do that that realized an opportunity super quick and made me forget. I I, I still remember you, Addie, but made me forget some of the, the the things about our startup pretty quick. I I would prefer if you could do something that made you forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> like, if for no other reason, because I know I'm a memorable person. And that means what you did was great. Oh, okay. That's me, okay. Me, like, I'm good. <laughs> that, is, that, is some, that is some expert level confidence. I, I approve. I'm working on it. <laughs> I love it. Well, okay. So um, what was, I am genuinely curious about this and you, I, people get weird about sharing this kind of information, but I like to dive in. And if you're not comfortable with any questions I ask you, totally fine. There's that's, that's all okay. Um, my big thing, um, especially from a travel planning perspective, since we are talking about money or were a minute ago, what did that cost you in terms of like picking up a flight that quickly to get to Turkey that weekend? You got fired on a Tuesday and you wound up in Turkey by Friday. I feel like that I, was actually, just... I should say I flew on Friday. Okay. And here's a key, oh, detail. Oh, sorry, sorry, here's a key a... detail of why I, I might have misspoke earlier. Here's a key detail why it might have been so cheap is because I didn't arrive until Sunday. <laughs> oh, oh, got it, got it. So if you don't care about how long it takes you, so what? So what did it? What did it set you back? Was that like? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I think I think it was probably. I, I don't truly remember. I think I found six hundred dollar flights to Istanbul, okay. which is fantastic. Okay. Um, and then uh, another here's a, here's a hot travel tip uh, for all your listeners is a lot of times by downloading the app of like a of a local provider, mm -hmm. uh, air provider. You can actually buy tickets on their app and like there might be some like geolocation thing too. You can buy tickets like on their app and when you're within their country for a oh. fraction of the price. So oh. you get like that currency. So I think like it was maybe, you know, five, 600 bucks to Istanbul. And then I flew to Ankara, spent the night in the Ankara airport. And then I flew to, I think directly into Sean Lorfa um, in the morning on Sunday and those connector flights in Turkey were, you know, 50 bucks yeah. or less. 50 that, bucks I, or less. I noticed that living in Spain and in China, that buying buying your travel when you get there, if you're traveling around inside the country, does tend to be less expensive than purchasing it stateside. There is. Yeah. A, and, and the crazy, like, it's it's risky. You're showing up. You don't have the next, you don't have your next flight. But, yeah. like, you're booking literally a flight for, like, three hours from now for 50 right. bucks. I just did the same thing in Bolivia. Um, two months ago as well. Like it, 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 without fail, 
Yeah. Um, it's a huge saver on airfare. That's amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm miffed we missed out on Bolivia. You'll have to tell me a little bit about that one. But I, I did want to also point out, this was funny to me, was I texted you. And are you able to tell me where you were when I texted? Because I was like, yeah, we should like get together. So I, I texted you about something about getting together or, or whatever. And you had mentioned like not being at uh, Stratus anymore. And, I, and, and then you told me where you were. Uh, I don't remember this text offhand. You... And it's not because you're not memorable. You're very memorable. Oh, <laughs> um, we but... already established I'm memorable. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, was, I thought, I think call, callback jokes play heavily. So I'll be doing <laughs> a lot of those. <laughs> I love it. Um, this is, a, this is about going on the podcast where, let's see, I'm trying to find a date. I think we'll be right. Oh man, this would have been like 20. Mm. Oh, I don't even know. I don't know. You you hadn't been gone long though. Oh, so okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, this is pretty soon after I left the startup, mm -hmm. um, and I sent you a picture. I think like uh, maybe even making you identify it a video. Yes. And yes. You did identify it yes. like a lunatic, and like I was very impressed. <laughs> I sent you, uh, there's like a UNESCO site in the center of Erbil, Kurdistan. And so I was taking a weekend trip while I was in Turkey, uh, going to Iraq, which I've always had this like fantasy, having worked in Iraq when it was more of a war zone of like right. going back without the body armor. So right. I got to, I got to achieve that a little bit and just do a weekend trip there. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what time of day or whatever else, but I had, I had it queued up. I had like just a panorama of the UNESCO site and you were like, how are you in Kurdistan? And I was like, how did you <laughs> even know that? Like that's, that's geo guesser, geo guesser on another level. Not even just in Kurdistan. I was like, how are, are you in Erbil? Yeah. And you were like, what the hell? Yeah. I, Where so, you have not been. I have not been. I, so yeah. like, yeah, I, 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 I uh, there's like two answers to this question. One is <laughs> savant and one is you've got my phone bugged. <laughs> no, I, well, not anymore, but uh, no. <laughs> Definitely. So I'm looking at pictures right now because I want to I want to show I want to showcase these. So what you had sent me was a picture of the Erbil Citadel, which is a which is a gorgeous. I'm going to I'm going to present here and share. Let's see if I can do this. I got this. This is so fun learning all this stuff. Here we go. It's just a quick little image search. But here we go. This is this is Erbil. This is the Citadel in Erbil. This is this structure is uh, 8000 years old. Sounds right. I want to say, and something along those lines. And it is stunning. I mean, you look at these, the, here's the plaza. Look at that. I just, holy crap. So what's funny was we had a coworker at our startup at Stratus. Oh, that this is true. This is true. Who was, uh, who had come to the States at 15 years old. He was, in, he was a refugee from Iraq and he still had family there. And he um, was from Erbil. And I talked I, to him about it, and that was how I knew it was talking. I've only to, spoken with him, yeah, three or four times, but I did, I did know this. He's an incredible human being. I actually want to get him on the podcast to talk about his experiences. But he, um, he was from Erbil originally, and he moved here to the states quite young again. And uh, yeah, he and I had talked about it a few times, and I looked up pictures, and I was like, "That's where you're from? Are you kidding me?" And I just, I was like, "I gotta go. I gotta go see this place." So I knew immediately when you sent me that picture, I was like, oh, "That's the Citadel." <laughs> I was just yeah, so excited. Well, I was like, great, so great crazy. recall. Great recall. Thank you. Well, no, I was, I was thrilled about that. So, so yeah, you got, you finally got your, your weekend vacation. So what was that like getting across the border and, and into Kurdistan and doing all that fun stuff? And Kurdistan is a region in Iraq, just for everyone's like references. Yeah. 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 One of, one of four regions, uh, probably could have been a, a country, yeah. but a little, little Picot Sykes agreement at the end of world war two was like, ah, group them all together. You can all yeah. be Iraq. Um, so pretty, pretty different uh, feel, environment, ethnicity than mm -hmm. the rest of Iraq, um, but its own and kind of like politically semi-autonomous now. Mm -hmm. um, worth a worth a Wikipedia wormhole for anyone it, that's unfamiliar. It feels like the like the, I hate to keep mentioning Catalonia because we just had a whole conversation about it because our previous guest was in Barcelona, but um, but it feels like the Catalonia almost of of Iraq, where it's like yeah, it's part of the country, but it's really not, and culturally, it's very different yeah. to a lot of things. Yeah. Um, don't know enough about Catalonia to make the, the compare and contrast, but, but all those things sound accurate. Just go with me on it. It's fine. Just assume I'm right all the time. That's <laughs> that I, that I will not do. And you know, I won't. 
Um, <laughs> I will challenge you on that one. <laughs> so yeah, so I got, so I, I think I was, rec- well, so actually first I tried to rent a car because okay. that's always my default move when I'm anywhere. Oh, okay. so like get, get, get a car and then I can stop where I want to. Um, second move was I was told to get a flight. Didn't like the prices. Didn't like, I don't even know if there was direct flights. I think I would have had to fly like Sean Lorfa back to Ankara, then to Erbil. It was expensive. The, the in-country discount was, was no longer applicable because you mm. were flying across international borders. Mm. Uh, so my third move then, uh, much to the locals chagrin, they thought I was being ridiculous, was to take a bus. Ah. And that bus was definitely challenging. Um, took a long time. I think it was like, you know, pair, like shouldn't have taken eight, eight-ish hours, but it did. Uh, mm. the way back, we got a flat tire actually too. Oh, God. Um, so, so yeah, it was challenging to get there, but again, uh, I kind of had was set on this, uh, in many ways. Mm-hmm. So I got my 48 hours or whatever back in Erbil and it's, boy, has it changed? It's like, you know, shades of like oil magnet. Uh, my friend that lives there lives in a neighborhood called dream city, which is just like skyscrapers and would put the housing stock of Philadelphia to shame probably. Wild. Um, I ate at like USA Steakhouse or something it was called. <laughs> <laughs> My friends were like, let's go out to a nice restaurant. I was like, you chose USA Steakhouse. It's <laughs> amazing. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't called that, but it was like an American city steakhouse, I think. And, but then, yeah, when you get down to like the old town and you walk around the Citadel, um, and walk through the Citadel like that, that feels yeah, you know, very, very different from from the oil magnet that I diagnosed the suburbs and the, the the outer parts parts of the city as. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So, um, I don't know. A lot, like, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of oil money there, so that's why there's such crazy yeah. cranes, cranes and skyscrapers. I, I, I feel like there, like every city claims to have like the worst uh, traffic. Mm-hmm. And many cities also claim, for whatever reason, to have like the most cranes in their skyline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Erbil is Erbil is one of those. They're like we got the you know the third most cranes per capita, third most you know cranes erected yesterday. Whatever whatever stat they want to cite. I hear that too, and that's funny you say that because I had never I had never considered that as a stat that people uh, tend to be proud of, and yet it's one I've rattled off about like Tampa, for example, because there's just so much going on uh, in the buildup in Tampa. And, oh, doubling the skyscraper in, in 10 years, which is great. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm here for it. Like, you know, it's a gorgeous but I, I, think, I think part of the thing that I'm getting out here is just like a billion different ways to like quote any statistic that it's like, right. well, you're talking pr- qu- cranes per capita, qu- right. cranes per square mile, right. cranes per guy's name, Jonathan, <laughs> like whatever it is. <laughs> cranes per American steakhouses. Uh, yeah. Cranes per Mohammed, I guess, in our deal. There you go. There you go. That's, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, what was the weather like while you were there? What, when, when were you there? Uh, so it was, this was end of May, early June of 2022. That's correct okay. year. Yeah. Years matter. Um, <laughs> and it was, I think one day a sandstorm rolled in and it was kind of like, lousy and little you guess you sweat a little bit and the sand sticks to you then too but it wasn't it wasn't oppressively hot i think like 80s 80s 90s and okay. most days were pretty nice except that, well most days i had two days one was a sandstorm right gotcha <laughs> fair well uh not humid i assume pretty arid i i think it was a little humid and that was like yeah i think it was a little humid okay um all right yeah i don't know i think i mean i definitely have the 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 sand sticking to me uh, feel on my skin right now, the little goosebumps are, um, and that was partially because I'm walking around and it's 80 to 90, but also there was humidity there. Fair, fair. Okay. All right. That is, that is wild. Well, and, and, and it's interesting that you were able to do this the way that you were able to do this. And this was like very little planning, very little, like, you know, lots of execution, but you know, little ahead of time stuff. You did a, um, a trip, a different type of trip that I think required a bit more planning um, and I think you sent me some pictures about this, or at least one picture. Um, this is this is the road trip that you took uh, through Central Asia, and I and yeah. I wanna, we can we can we can go whichever way you want. We can talk about this. We can look at the pictures that you sent. Like, where? How would you like to approach? This is, this um, is yeah. So so I'll just I'll jump into it. You you guide me. Um, yeah, I, I'm excited to be on this podcast, and uh, 
if we don't cover it all. Oh no, this is just last week in German town. Oh, that's great. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll like flip through here. Let's see if I can, can I skip flip, 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 flip through the pictures. <gasps> I can. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. So, yeah. So this is the end of a 10,000 mile road trip. Started in La Havre, France, went to Ulan Bator, Mongolia. I guess this is actually like two miles uh, east of Ulan Bator, Mongolia. This is the world's largest equestrian. I don't know how to say equestrian. There's another word like that means horse statue. Big, biggest world horse statue. You got it here. It's got Genghis Khan on it. It's 100 feet high. Everyone <laughs> loves it. It's in the middle of nowhere. That's amazing. What is this, is my, this is my brother with me. Ah, excellent. Wait, you you are one of three. I'm oldest. one of three. I'm the oldest of three. Okay. And so when I put, so you talked to us about kind of the planning aspect of this. Um, it is my third kind of big road trip. So uh, that, that move, like first step in uh, Turkey, I was like, get a car. That's, <laughs> I've, done it, I've done it three times. Got a car three times. Well, really four times. Like, oh, this, this, guy this, tri this trip actually went through two cars. Okay. Um, so four times. <laughs> oh my God. And uh and so the, the, my planning process is really where are you going to sleep most nights? Mm. And if I've got 80% of like the, the, the bedding locations figured out, mm -hmm. then, you know, every day is a joy and I can, I can create within that. Mm. So I put together a map, I put together, you know, 80% of my sleeping locations based on my uh, very fortunate to have global network. And then I put out this list of, cities with international airports to seven of my closest friends, including my two brothers. Okay. And that group of seven friends then uh, joined me for lengths of the trip. Uh, my brother, Sam shown here joined me for uh, almost, I think 70 of those 100 days actually. So he joined a ton of it. Nice. Very cool. So what, um, okay. So this wasn't part of anything specific, right? This wasn't like a, like a race situation or it was inspired by what, what you and other viewers may know as the Mongol rally, but, but the Mongol rally, uh, a group of people that get like undersized cars in London and try to drive them to a mm -hmm. They, they also do it a little bit for like time. And there's like, you know, finishing it in a certain amount and finishing it with like a piece of your car. Like those are um, part of the allure for me. It was like, why would I race through this thing? It sounds like you're racing through this thing either for the, um, st the, the stature of it or mm -hmm. for your, your job needs, but quit the job and <laughs> didn't, didn't care to, to accelerate and uh, wanted to explore the world on the way. So spent a hundred days doing it where I think mo most Mongol rally racers do between like one and three weeks. I was going to say, it's a pretty, a pretty quick one, relatively speaking. We and ran into some Mongol rally folks on, on the route there, including like this group of like three, like Scottish high school friends that were all in their uh, first part of their sixties that were like doing it as like a final huzzah to the world or something. They were hilarious. Wow. Yeah. Ran into you them waiting, waiting friends, at the Mongolian like, border. I was like, oh, high school, that would be a fun time to go. No. Okay. No, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I bur buried the lead there. 60, 63 no, no, you're year, good. 63 yeah. year old guys. <laughs> it was good. I like it. I like it. What, um, what kind of like, it's a road trip, but I, I think of it as like, you know, road trips in the States, it's pretty easy to like, I don't know, find a, find a, um, uh, what am I thinking of toll plazas, the whole, like you get words escape me. I'm a, I'm on, I'm on the Eastern corridor and they call it. Yeah. Use, just use, you have, the, like, use the symbols. <laughs> um, I'll guess this will be, there'll be an intermediate, like we do like a, Intermission charades. <laughs> Sounds like two words. Okay, here we go. Uh, no, it, it, but you've got interstates. We're rotten with interstates here in the States. Um, we've got um, whatever's the toll. What's the toll? You pay the toll to go on the thing. The p turnpike. Ha! Okay. There got you go. it. Right. <laughs> yes. I don't know what I thought they were called, but there we are. So you, you've got turnpikes and stuff like that. So, okay, when you're when you're driving from France to Mongolia. Um, what did you, what did you run into in terms of like, were you able to find gas? Were you able to find places to stop and eat? Could you find restrooms easily? Like typical things that you have to deal with on a road trip. Yeah. So it covered like 16 or 18 countries, I think. And the answer for each is different. And maybe is the theme <laughs> of each one could be a different podcast, perhaps um, <laughs> a, a gas mishap actually. So we started in a minivan that I shipped from Jersey to Le Havre, France. I had to work through the, the 
seemed like the penal system, but it was really just like the import system of France in order to get it. They take holidays two times a week and all the administrative offices close. I'm like finishing up on a farm. That other picture you showed me was me working on a, a squash organic farm, uh, like waiting for my van to oh, arrive. My, my face is all cut up from a beach ultimate Frisbee tournament, uh, but I'm planting squash waiting for my van. I get the van. This Super, there, there I am, all cut yes. up, just planted a bunch of squash. I love it. Um, beat up. Should have seen the other guy. Nope, it was just, it was just, the, it was just the ground. It was just the ground. You um, fighting with the earth. Oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a theme. There's a theme of my life. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, but I finally get the van. Uh, my other brother, not pictured and with good reason, um, because the falling story is, is his to own. We go to a French gasoline stop. They call them gas stations, I heard. Um, and they have a product advertised at French gasoline stations called Gazole. And Gazole, to a non-French speaker, feels like the first two syllables of Gasoline. I'm, I'm in. I'm here. He's, he's pulling the nozzle. It looks like we're going to just get right back on the road. But sneak attack in French, gazole is diesel. And we filled our car with diesel and it broke down. And then like a week later, blew some pistons in the engine and see you later minivan. We were carless. What did you do? Where were you when this happened? On the German Autobahn. Oh my God. Like actually? Which is, which is good because I speak German. So okay. the people that were actually on the scene first, um, yeah, my my advanced car mechanics in German, weak, but as with many German words, it's just like three other words pushed together. Right. So Your telephone and, and, and I was actually with another buddy who <laughs> is an even better German speaker than me. So we figured it out. But actually my two lines of the entire trip, maybe we'll get to the other one today. Two amazing lines. Um, the guy who was first on the scene in German said, looked under the hood, saw the blown pistons and said, and I'm like, well, how bad is it? Can we get back on the road? And he's like, er hat die Geist abgegeben, which means it's given up the spirit. And I was like, that's the most <laughs> romantic thing that's ever been said about a dying car. Oh my God. <laughs> Please say that again. How do you say it? Er hat die Geist abgegeben. Er hat die Geist ab abgegeben? Yeah, it's given up, it's given up the spirit. The you ghost. Have the guys abgegeben. Oh my God, that's hilarious. Abgegeben. You have the ice abgegeben. Okay. Amazing. Um, okay. So yeah. you're on the Autobahn. That's a good place. That is, you're right. That is a good place. I mean, it's better than being in like, you know, a farmland in the middle of nowhere and you're like trudging somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think really like we weren't close to, I mean, we're in Western Germany, which is pretty populated, but like not near, you know, like a major anything. Like, like we were, we were relatively rural, but, mm -hmm. um, I had a I had a van full of ultimate frisbee players, so we quickly <laughs> tapped like everyone's network. I had my buddy Glenn, the German speaker, and my buddy Dustin, who had friends that were like forty five minutes away that came and picked us up. Like we we figured it out. Um, the real I think I think the language barrier would have been really tough if we were still in France. Yeah. Um, so that is probably good. We were in Germany or or Belgium or somewhere where we had yeah English or Dutch or something. Fair, fair. Okay. All right. So auto troubles, auto troubles def definitely happened. But as far as finding gas uh, that wasn't gasoline, you were. <laughs> yeah. So otherwise, uh, we found gas fine while we had the van. But then the next vehicle I acquired uh, required diesel fuel. <laughs> and that's that <laughs> final. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back to France. We're good. But no, we were going on. We were going, unfortunately, uh, as diesel fuel goes through Central Asia, where there was not great, because I guess diesel fuel is more refined than gasoline. Okay. And there are less stations, particularly in Uzbekistan, that oh. don't do a lot of diesel. So in one occasion in Uzbekistan, we're like poking around for diesel. We end up, there's a picture somewhere, I can probably send you this as well, okay. um, of 26 uh, Uzbeks. We like tell one guy, he tells another guy, he brings in his cousin, he like flags down a bus. Like, <laughs> literally 26 people around the four of us in our car, like trying to figure out what diesel fuel is with Google, Trans <laughs> with Google translate. And like, we're like literally smelling it. And like, is it oilier? Like putting it between our fingers, uh, like lighting a match to it. Does it light like gas? Is it light like, light like diesel fuel? We don't know, um, you know, I'm head thinking, from tails. And, the, uh, and actually this got to the other best line of the whole thing, which is, uh, I don't know how you hit on these two stories immediately. That's what I but, do. 
we got a you know 14 year old Uzbek is the only guy that spoke any English and uh, a bus that got flagged down has a can of what they say is diesel fuel in the back. And we're like to the 14 year old, we're like, you know, we, we can't, no one has diesel fuel. How does this, you know, how can this possibly be diesel fuel? We need to be, be certain. And the kid goes, I can't be certain it's diesel fuel, but this bus driver is an Uzbek and he says it's diesel fuel and Uzbeks never tell a lie. Uh, so, so we did, we put it in and it was next never tell a lie because it was diesel fuel and off we went. Okay. That, okay. Good to know. Uzbeks never tell a lie. This, I feel like this needs to be like a bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah. I, I should make Uzbeks this a bumper sticker. Tell a lie. That's things you learn. Yeah. One of those, the I, more, you know I, I didn't know the trustworthiness of Uzbeks before. I had no idea until this yeah. story. And I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad to know that if someone, if I ever meet an Uzbek, I'm going to know that they're not lying to me. Yes. Lovely. <laughs> remarkable so, so yeah so we the the fuel fuel knowing the fuel of your vehicle and how to acquire it turns out to be an important facet that many including myself might overlook in favor of knowing where they sleep that night but maybe shouldn't always be overlooked <laughs> you know it's it, lessons learned that just goes in the yeah. lessons learned it's lesson learned box. that's for that's for future greg <laughs> that's wonderful i you meet so many awesome people. And I love that you have this network. You always talk about the network of people you've got in your life. And it just blows my mind because I'm a networker and I love talking to strangers. Uh, what What's like, what's one of the things that like, as far as your network, you know, coming through for your, like, what's something that you've been able to do for your network? Like in, in your I mean, the, the you biggest have- source of my network, like I mentioned where I used to work a little bit, but like the biggest source of my network is that I played some high level ultimate Frisbee in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I play on a traveling club team to this day, even though I'm slowly aging out of it. Um, <laughs> I have played in the, the fledgling American semi-professional league of which there is a Philadelphia team, go Philadelphia Phoenix, uh, a first year women's team, go Philadelphia surge, but I'm a DC guy. So those are my, those are my teams there. It's all sorts of conflict, but um, you're, you're that, saying this to a lightning and Royals fan. So we good. Oh, Tampa Bay had a team, but they uh, went out of business uh, last year. They 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 shut their doors. That's so sad. I have a jersey though, the Tampa Bay Cannons. It's now a collector's cannons. item. It's a collector's item now. Yeah. I the Cannons. Okay, whatever. I think it started. I think the franchise maybe started in Jacksonville, and there maybe is like some fort there with cannons or something, but moved on over to Tampa Bay. I don't I know. I made it a point to stay as far away from Jacksonville as possible. St. Augustine well, has some. Nice they, they did two after they realized it, I guess. <laughs> Oh, we're in Jacksonville. Let's go to Tampa. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, this is a, a, an anecdote within a tangent, within a, a, spiral. Side, a side project. <laughs> um, all that, was all, no, that was all to say, I know a lot of ultimate fr- frisbee players. Uh, and I think the biggest thing I have done to give back, at least in a conscious way, mm-hmm. is all along a lot of these trips, I have given clinics. Um, I've given some clinics in Turkey before. We did one in Uzbekistan. Uh, we... You mean ultimate frisbee clinics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, so you're just I, taking ultimate frisbee around the world and like? I, I helped. I did. I was an assistant coach for the India national team before. Um, I played Sorry, in Ger- I played in German college yeah. national. Yeah. So yeah. like everywhere I go. India has a national ultimate frisbee team. They do. They do. I am learning so much today. I had yeah. no idea. This is wild you're blowing my whole mind this is fantastic so yeah so like a lot a lot of times like uh you can you can if you you know go even on facebook you find like a local team you go to the, one of their practices and uh when it turns out you can play a little bit they'll they'll ask for more <laughs> that's a, that's awesome that is so freaking cool that's actually i mean it's good good timing to show that picture because that that ground collision was was ultimate frisbee related <laughs> So it had nothing to do with the squash. It had nothing to do with the squash, but okay. it, yeah, just uh, this, wasn't, this wasn't like a particularly like rambunctious vegetable that you were tussling. I had been playing. I actually got an opportunity to play with the French under twenty four national beach team, and I embarrassed myself pretty heavily um, by not being. I thought like, I, I as as an American, where there are some of the best ultimate frisbee is played in the U.S. Hmm. I generally think I can walk into any team and contribute immediately. I could not contribute to this French under 24 team. They were really good. Um, and in my attempt to make up for it, um, just ended up hurting myself. Oh my God. You're hilarious. 
I, I, this is great. Okay. So let's, let's talk about some of the other pictures that you have in here. So what's this, what's going on here? Oh, uh, so I think as I said last week, this was two weekends ago. Um, I, I don't, I, yeah, we can take this, like I can talk, uh, going around the world, obviously, and we have a lot already. Um, but there's like some travel to be done. And I think from some of the podcasts I listened to already, we should be doing this with a drink in hand. You're often talking about local, a local brewery, um, mm -hmm. or, or a local destination. This was my attempt at the same, like when I'm around in Philadelphia and then kind of a newbie to Philadelphia, I still feel like at times, like let's explore the neighborhood. I live in Germantown. I put together a drinking whiskey scavenger hunt of kind of like the, the mile radius around my house. Okay. So one of the clues was put out a fire and you get, you know, creativity points for doing it in the most creative fashion. So this is us. We just went into a fire company and we're like, yeah, can we can we grab grab your hose a little bit? And they were like, "Get get on it." No comment. I love it. Yeah, I love smaller it. smaller hose than anticipated. To tell you the truth. <clears throat> yep. Nope. You're 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 goading me. <laughs> I know. I know my audience. I know, I know my audience. <laughs> Play to it. Play to it. <laughs> See, uh, I will say. I will say. Um, you have uh, you have a knack for um, really creative events. You you grew up on a farm. It's true. In, in rural PA. True. And you use that farm to your advantage a lot, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And you have annual, all kinds of really cool annual events. Uh, you have the uh, Survivor Challenge. Yeah. So the Survivor Challenge, I took over on its 10th anniversary. Okay. Um, I was part, I was a cat. I was a contestant on some previous versions, also in Kutztown. Um, but then uh, I was the host for the 10th annual. We did it at the farm and you yourself were a contestant. I was. I learned that year that if you go out early, you drink sooner. <laughs> and, which was helpful because that was that was my way of, of placating my ego when I went out early because I am just that unathletic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm still, I mean, it's, it's, it's too bad you bowed out when you did because the people that finished in the final three are like still like, holding that badge of honor. Like there, there was a lot of pride at stake that day. That's amazing. I love it. Well, okay. So uh, was this part of the same thing? Part of the same thing. Uh, the second, yeah. So this is a uh, act statuesque. The I'm, I'm behind the camera in this one, but this is ah. my team, my team acting statuesque. That makes a lot. Of, I thought maybe they were like um, busking or something. <laughs> it really was not the, the cup on the ground threw me, but no. Oh yeah. No, that's just full of whiskey. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Where's so it's called the whiskey amble. I love the whiskey amble. Yes. I love this picture so much. So this is a recent one from Bolivia. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I work fully remote now. I think many, hopefully many people are able to do that and then uh, get some of the advantages out of it. So mm -hmm. I spent the month of February in Bolivia nice. and it was, it's actually, it was a very challenging experience for me because like to balance work and not be a full-time tourist. Like I'm good at turning it on and off. And there were many days at the end of the day, I could feel like a bad tourist and a bad employee. And that's <laughs> not, not a good place to be. But each weekend I did uh, kind of find um, some free time. This weekend I went to Toro Toro, which is a dinosaur fossily footprinty sort of place in central South Bolivia. And they had some vistas to, to oversee. Mm. Bolivia is very, very high up. Like it is, it is altitudinous. Yeah. I spent four days with a headache at the beginning. I was in Cochabamba, uh, like, which is, I think like eight to 9,000 feet above sea level. Okay. And puts we're, De we're puts Denver to shame. Yeah, it really does. And it's, it's, it's cause what Denver is, uh, well, it's the mile high city. So that, that puts it at four, oh, I forgot what a mile is. 4,000. Uh, I think it's 5,600. So I think, I think Denver, I think Denver's at like 6,000. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That tracks. Yeah. I, uh, I, I have noticed that about altitudes. I have to be very careful when I, when I go up, I tend to succumb to altitude sickness. So what did you, you flew in, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yep. you didn't, you uh, didn't, not a, not, not a road trip, not a road trip, not time. a road trip <laughs> to Bolivia. Um, but when, when you got in, um, like, so this was like immediate, like you were dealing with like headachey stuff or you like, yeah, I mean, 24 hours in, I don't think I felt much, but then like days two, three, four, um, loss of appetite, headache. That was, mm. that was about it. Um, I mean, like whatever I was, I was in it for the experience. Sometimes when stuff sucks, it's still kind of rich in another way. 
I heard um, I heard staying really, really hydrated helps with that. Were you able to acquire water easily? Like, Yeah. Um, we were right next to a grocery store, really cheap accommodations at the center of Cochabamba, big old bottles of water. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I just, I just kind of gritted and bared it. I don't know if I did like a lot of like uh, self-treatment or extra hydration. Um, and, and <laughs> in fact, I think on day, on day three or something, I think on day three, I played ultimate and just yelled <laughs> and just yelled that there wasn't enough air the entire time while people were like, beat, beating me and running. And I was like bent over with my hands on my knees. Like there's not even enough air up here to breathe. What are you guys doing? And they got a kick out of that. And then I think on day four, still with a headache, I decided that it was time to climb a mountain. So I climbed to 15,000 feet and also was hunched over with my hands on my knees. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it was, it was high. The sound, the sound in places like this is very strange. Like the highest road in the United States is on the Guanella Pass in the Rocky Mountains, about an hour and a half outside of Denver. At least that's as I understand it. Um, it took me three attempts to traverse it by car <laughs> because we had to turn back because of snow two times. The first two times I went, uh, the third time it was finally like June. So we didn't have to deal with, with, with snow. But when we got up top, it was definitely colder. And what I noticed immediately was like, yeah, sound does not travel because there's no air for the sound waves to pass through. So like you almost sound like you're like you're sitting in a self-contained box a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if I was, I, I should go back and I guess do it again with an, uh, an ear to sound because I don't know if I thought about that a lot. Um, it might not. I mean, also yeah. if you're on your own, you're probably not like talking to yourself. I, don't know. I was, I was, I was actually with a buddy who was born in Bolivia. Um, okay. so, so most of the time I was with him, this Torah Torah trip that you have a picture here is actually the one exception of kind of something that I did solo. Yeah. Um, the 15,000 foot climb though we did together and yeah, we didn't talk a lot. We just like breathed really heavy and I don't know, said hi to llamas and alpacas and tried to distinguish between the two. That's so cool. That is yeah. so cool. Let's see what else we got here. So next slide is, uh, what is this? Uh, a waterfall hike also in Bolivia. Um, you showing yeah, I, off per usual. Me showing off per usual. I wanted I, the, the picture I wanted to send you was me looking up uh, at the waterfall from within the waterfall, which is the end destination of the hike. But I'm a little scantily clad, so I didn't. I, I know, I know, I know. Nearly anything flies in this podcast, but I didn't feel comfortable with it. I, I mean, I. It's so what I. What... What I said earlier, my previous guest was, uh, it's a family show, so curse away. <laughs> no, I mean, that, 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 that's rarely, that's rarely, a, rarely a tool. I think, I think, I mean, here's a world, world view with Greg Esser. I think a lot of times cursing is just like being lazier than using the, the flourishes our language provided. Well, my flourishes tend to find their way not into my brain when I need them. So that usually results in a pretty solid as a result <laughs> you know that's just when i'm in this but jim jim downloaded some really great i want to see if i have them but he's got some really great sound effects on here to uh to counter that which i found intimidating because i was like oh well what happens if i do this thing he was like oh no i got you covered here we go was it oh it didn't do it damn it. oh because i have the volume turned all the way down <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like the boarding sign on an airplane and it literally is yeah yeah Ooh, that, that, this, this should be a game for your guests is like identify these travel sounds. Oh, well, here's, here's another good one for you. Uh, let's try that one. Seatbelt can turn off? Yes. Yeah, let's go. Uh, what is, oh, this is just a... <laughs> now, yeah, the question is that, that, I think that's just a plane overhead. I don't know if that's like landing or... or I, I think it is just flying. And if overhead. you could name the type of plane, that would be impressive. But I oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I probably should have just, yeah, fired fired at will. Oh, that was all of them. That was that was all of your fun photos. Uh, we can do the... We can use the, the video if you would like to show us your video of you and Bolivia doing your thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, like, so I had... There's, I think there's... Uh... Oh, oh, I can do it this way. What? Oh, oh yeah, make those who mint us. So what are you doing here? What is what is happening? So I, don't, I don't know the names of all these objects, but there's like a flat stone, and then I've got this like stone in my hand that kind of has like two spots for your thumbs almost. Um, that you grind up corn on the cob to make fresh cornmeal. Mm -hmm. Then you add cheese to it, salt to it, raisins to it. Oh. Um, did we add eggs? I feel like we added eggs. Oh. And then you wrap it, wrap it in the corn husk, and you can bake it, or you can 
steam it. Bake it or steam it. And there's two different types of like little cheesy corny pouches. I assume that's what this little green thing is up here in the corner. Yeah, that's that's my this was a Snapchat that I took. So that's my little dan my dancing humintas. That is so cool. Oh, How dance, did you dance, you sexy it? little humintas? <laughs> So is this at a restaurant? Was this a thing you could do as a tourist? Or so you this is something that, so one of, one of the souvenirs I like to bring back from like many of my travels is knowing how to make a local dish. Um, so this is always uh, on my radar and okay. yeah, poking around the entire time. My buddy Danilo, I was with um, his family offered to give me some cooking tips and lessons. That's a very meat heavy town. And ideally I would love to learn a dish that wasn't meat heavy. Gotcha. Um, so I found this uh, little co-op that like uh, is for kind of imparting some mental health and economic lessons to women that have dealt with hardship and abuse, mostly okay. from rural, mostly from rural areas. It's okay. being run by an amazing like 26 year old British woman that moved there like five years ago. Wow. Um, she was really inspirational, but yeah, she was running this running this thing. And one of the things they do to raise money is they put on these cooking lessons. Do you remember the name of it? Oh, uh, no. Nah. If you can send it to me, I'll, uh, I'll post it on the website. If you can find it. I'll yeah. Um, it I'm sure that. that I can. Let me, yeah, I, yeah. It's, yeah, find it. we'll I, I, I can, I can provide it in post. It's so freaking cool, man. I love that. Yeah. That was amazing. So, okay. Wow. That those pictures were fun. That was really neat. Like I love the, and again, like the, the stories that you've told me, and it's so funny because you're one of those people who like, you'll just throw something off in like, sorry, someone's doing something illegal outside. So there's all this fire. <laughs> it's silly. Uh, but, but yeah, like you'll, you have these throwaway moments where you're like, say almost like a non sequitur uh, about your travel. And I'll just be like, I'm sorry, when you were where now? Like, <laughs> like it blows my mind. Yeah, actually this is, this is, this is my uh, like, uh, not even, a, it's not a humble brag, it's just a brag brag. Uh, Bolivia was my 50th country in this, yeah! in this, in this lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shabazz. That's amazing. Mubarak. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I don't know why I say Shabazz. My mom, my mom always said Shabazz and I looked it up the other day and I was like, Shabazz just means like strong boy. I think it just, <laughs> really, I don't think it means what she thinks it means. Cause she always said it meant congratulations in Urdu, but I was like, I, I, I don't think that's right, but I could be wrong. I don't know. I am none the wiser, but whether it means congratulations or strong boy, I will be using it. I take it. Let's go with it. <laughs> Mubarak, Mubarak means congratulations. Is awesome. so, uh, wonderful. What, okay. So here's, here's one question that I've always wanted to ask you. And I know we're, we're kind of winding down a little bit here, but I think this is really important um, for our listeners to learn about is what about safety? Cause this is one of those things where you're traveling to places that, uh, I mean, you even said you worked in a war zone, you've been to places where you're working with refugees um, and and there's always this sense of like, okay, there could be like issues with safety. Now, as a woman traveling abroad, this may mean something a little bit different to me, right? If I'm traveling across Central Asia, culturally speaking, there may be some different expectations about how I behave, how I dress, where I am, if I'm alone, right? Like, what's your takeaway um, from your perspective, middle-aged white man, <laughs> of, like, <laughs> of like how you get around and whether whether this is something you would be able to recommend to everyone or not yeah i mean like it's uh, the i was listening to your first couple of episodes here on the the trippy pod and there was a great exchange between you and jim where you, you sound like even like your world views differed pretty heavily mm -hmm. um i won't be able to repeat exactly the words the where we were saying it was dangerous and jim was like well jim, jim, jim was like the world is dangerous so protect yourself yeah. and, you, and you were like and you were like the world is dangerous so explore carefully right yeah i think Thank you. That actually is a spectacular apt description of that conversation. So yeah. So anyway. Um, and I am much closer in alignment with you. Okay. Um, I do think that I got, I, I mean, there's a couple factors here that you already listed and I'll put them into my own words, which is to say when you work in a war zone at 23, it, you know, you feel like you've already done your most dangerous thing and you feel empowered to go make a mistake. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, by being a white American male, like uh, mm -hmm. I often feel in control of my body and situation mm -hmm. more so than someone of a different gender, stature, whatever might might feel. Sure. Um, all of those things said, um, I think the number one tool that I use is like I like I'm traveling alone, but mm -hmm. like. 
very rarely am I truly alone, even on that Toro Toro tour. Mm-hmm. That's a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I very quickly latched on to um, a, a two sisters that were traveling together from Slovakia. And they were like my little posse for the day uh, going in caves, hanging out and like, you know, on that road trip across Eurasia, put out the notice to seven of my friends, but most often I'm crashing with someone that I know or a friend of a friend. I'm finding out someone in these locations. When I'm traveling to India, I'd meet up with the local ultimate Frisbee team. And I see like jazz in the park as my social activity for the night as Mm -hmm. facilitated by, you know, my now teammates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm rarely in the situation where I have to, I mean, I'm always trusting a stranger, but Mm -hmm. I'm like, making a stranger my friend on my own terms rather than in the moment having to be like, Hey, stranger, hold my wallet. Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I like to think that like I'm creating like trust and maybe one day I'll get burned on that, but I'm creating trust with an individual in most of these locations who is a local who speaks the language Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, and, and, you know, always trust a news back, you know, (laughs) to bring it full fold. I love it. I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. I thank you for that. That's actually really helpful and and great advice. I think that's something that a lot of people could uh, um to stand to hear is is and Jim, and, and, and and I think the ultimate angle, sorry. Has, no, you're fine. You're fine. I just it's one of those words like yeah, if you're if you're constantly scared of the world, like that is going to affect your, your, your mindset on stuff. And it's easy to be scared of things that you're unfamiliar with to your point. You know, once you've been in something like a war zone, everything else feels like cake. But once you get into that space, it's like, well, it is different no matter where you are. You have to be aware of that, but that's experience. And yeah. the thing I would say about like ultimate, like that's like clearly specific to, to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think these little communities exist in nearly everything. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a passion, like, the, the the awakening moment happened early in the pandemic where like a lot of the ultimate league shut down. And I was hanging out with my friend in Northern Virginia who used to play ultimate as well. And he's getting really big into bird watching. We went to like a bird watching convention for some special bird that's never in Virginia. There was like 50 people there. They're like, it was a duck. They were so amped up about this thing. Yeah. And it was a Chinese duck. It was, it was a rainbow bunting. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the Chinese duck one. It was a rainbow bunting and this group of 50 people were like stoked out of their mind, but there was like a camaraderie about it. And this is only to say that these little uh, special communities exist that if you look, if you're like going to Uzbekistan and you look up bird watchers or chess players or ultimate Frisbee players or people that only breathe through one nostril at a time, you'll (laughs) probably find your community and it will be great. Fantastic. That is amazing. All right. Yeah. Well, I, okay. You know what? I can't, I can't top that. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn the music back on. That was spectacular. I'm serious. That's, that might be some of the best advice I have ever heard as a traveler. That was, thank you. Great. I did it. You did it. You did the thing. Well, all right. So do you have um, anything you want to pitch? Any socials, any place to find you, anything that you're excited about? No, I'm, 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 I don't, I mean. Can we find you on social? Yeah, like, I mean, if you actually, I mean, like, I, this isn't, this isn't for me. This is for you. If you, oh, if you wow. want it, if, if you're, if you're, if it, listeners want to see, like, I did, I, I had aspirations of being, like, more of a social media presence yeah. um, when I drove across Eurasia. Every yeah. Thursday I put out a video. They're all available on YouTube with, like, 10 views a piece. It's nice. called, it's called Straight Outta Kempton, K E M P T O N. Uh, like my little uh, rural village in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you'll find some good stuff there. There's a blog spot of my two other crazy worldwide road trips uh, called Bordering America that can be found. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like, but this is this is a trippy promise, right? You're trying to consolidate all these resources into one thing. Um, but those are how I communicated with the world when I was doing the trips. But yep. they're they're hard, noticeably hard to find. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully, trippy can can consolidate things in a way that's easier to access love it well thank you for that pitch i'll you can come back anytime sir (laughs) flattery will get you everywhere perfect amazing well thank you so 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 much i'm gonna i'm gonna say that this has been adelaide braddock ceo of trippy uh with greg esser 
talking about his amazing travel experiences here on the Trippy Podcast today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Go Trippy.